Hey guys, Carlson here to go over lecture four of chapter eight, our very last one. We're going to start off with eight and nine. It covers reflexes, which are rapid automatic responses to stimuli. Now, we're, we've been studying the central and peripheral nervous system separately, but they do function together, and part of what they do together is form our reflexes. Now, that automatic response is a motor or an output response to a specific stimulus. Uh, they do help us preserve homeostasis by making rapid adjustments, whether it's in the function of an organ itself or a whole organ system. And there's a little variability, so usually whatever stimulus uh, you have, it's going to give you the same motor response the majority of the time. Now, reflexes involve your sensory fibers, and whenever I say fibers, you should think axons. Uh, delivering information from peripheral receptors to the central nervous system and then motor fibers carrying motor commands to the peripheral effectors which again are usually some kind of organ organ system and um, the wiring of a single reflex is called a reflex arc and there's a really good diagram here in your textbook uh, that shows you the components of a reflex arc using an example of a, the withdrawal reflex um, so you get the arrival of a stimulus and activation of a receptor uh, two would be the activation of a sensory neuron, and over here is your key, so uh, the red line here is a sensory neuron being stimulated. Um, part three, information is going to be processed in the central nervous system. So here we have sensation relayed to the brain by axon collaterals, and remember this is a section of your spinal cord. Uh, four, activation of a motor neuron, and then finally uh, five, response by the effector. And uh, reflex response usually removes or opposes stimulus. So this is going to be an example of a negative feedback. And again, the withdrawal reflex is one we're about to identify as one of the two types here in a second. So you may want to go back to this when we start talking about the two types. All right. Uh, there are simple reflexes or monosynaptic reflexes. Um, that means a sensory neuron synapses directly on a motor neuron that performs the information processing function. If we have one synapse, we have a rapid, more stereotyped motor response, such as the stretch reflex. Uh, this is uh, an example of this would be the patellar reflex that your doctor uses to assess your spinal cord condition by making your leg kick. And there's a picture of that on page 283. I think we're all familiar with that uh, test at the doctor. Um, now, in this type of reflex, your small specialized skeletal muscle fibers, otherwise known as muscle spindles, are the sensory receptors for the stretch reflex in particular, and they regulate muscle length in this case. Now, complex or polysynaptic reflexes is when there is at least one interneuron between the afferent and motor neurons. Okay, remember afferent, then would be your sensory neurons. Uh, the more synapses, there are the longer the delay between the stimulus and the response. So even though there's a, this isn't as quick as a monosynaptic reflex, there are more involved response, uh, responses, which means that there are more interneurons that can control more groups. So it may be more of a complex, uh, more involved uh, stimulus. Uh, some examples are that withdrawal reflex we just talked about. Uh, this moves stimulated parts of the body away from a source of stimulus. There's also the flexor reflex, a, a specific withdrawal reflex that involves the muscles of a limb. Uh, the strongest withdrawal reflexes are stimulated by pain. Not, not too surprising, really. Now, integration and control of spinal reflexes. Remember, the reflexes are automatic, but the brain does influence these responses by stimulating or inhibiting the interneurons and motor neurons involved. So there's some sensitivity modification that occurs with the brain, like how much do I have to pull away? Or how much do I have to flex? Now there are some other descending fibers that do have inhibitory effects on spinal reflexes. One um, is the Babinski sign or the Babinski reflex and there is a positive and a negative reflex type uh, and they go from being an infant to adulthood. So the stroking of an infant's foot on the side of the sole produces a fanning motion which is the positive Babinski reflex or the Babinski sign. Uh, this disappears as you get older to the adult reflex of curling the toes from the same stimulus and that we call that the plantar reflex or the Babinski negative reflex. Um, this is important because if you have damage to your higher centers like your brain or descending tracts, it will cause the Babinski sign, the original sign, so that fanning motion to reappear which could indicate a, a central nervous system injury. 
Now, uh, keep in mind that reflex is essentially by time for the planning and execution of more complex responses that are often then consciously directed. So for example, if you touch a hot stove and you pull it away real quickly, that's your reflex. But now your brain's gonna be like, oh, okay, that's hot, I probably shouldn't touch that again. Uh, at least without, you know, oven mitts or whatnot. <clears throat> now, 810 talks about the separate pathways that carry sensory information and motor commands. So the communication among the central nervous system, peripheral nervous system, and organs occurs over pathways, tracks, and nuclei that rely, relay sensory and motor information. The names of these uh, major sensory or ascending tracks and the major motor or descending tracks of the spinal cord are based on the destinations of the axons, so where they go. So if you have a track beginning with spino, that means it starts in the spinal cord, ends in the brain. And that's a sensory track then. Uh, the track ending with spinal starts in the higher centers or the brain spinal cord and ends in the spinal cord equaling motor commands. So the rest of the name will then indicate the associated nucleus or the cortical area of the brain. And I have a table here for you to kind of jot down some notes uh, so that you can see um, what sensory and motor pathways are the uh, biggest and most important ones for us to know for this chapter. So just go through, you know, we have the posterior column, uh, spinothalamic, and the spinocerebellar pathways for sensory. And then for motor, we have corticospinal pathway and medial and lateral pathways. So just jot down a few notes of all their functions and you'll be good to go for this. And the only other thing I wanted to mention is we talk about, we've talked about action potential uh, that's an impulse or electrical impulse. It's also known as a sensation. Okay, so the arriving information to these pathways can also be um, described as a sensation. All right, 811, the autonomic nervous system co is composed of the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions. Um, it's involved in the unconscious regulation of body functions, which um, actually is much more important than some of our conscious uh, thoughts and abilities. So, for example, you know, without the ANS, a simple night's sleep would actually be a life-threatening event because the ANS basically controls everything that happens with your body at that point. Now, uh, remember that the uh, PNS is divided into the efferent and afferent divisions, and so we're focusing on the efferent division, and that's both the ANS and the SNS. Uh, they both carry motor commands to the peripheral effectors, but there are very clear anatomical differences. So remember the somatic nervous system uh, is the lower motor neurons will exert direct control over the skeletal muscles. The autonomic nervous system is a second motor neuron will always separate the central nervous system and the peripheral effector. So we're going to focus on the ANS here in a second, but here you can see the organization of the two next to each other. This is your somatic nervous system. So again, you just have a somatic motor nuclei of the brainstem here. Uh, we have the upper motor neurons and the primary uh, motor cortex and then somatic motor nuclei of the spinal cord basically sending a message to the effector skeletal muscles. If you look at the ANS, you have, and I have a circle here, right in here, you see we have those preganglionic neurons in between the stimulation of a visceral effector. So there's something in between, or what, remember, an interneuron, at least one, when we're talking about the ANS. So, in more detail, the ANS motor neurons in the central nervous system are called preganglionic neurons. They send their axons, called preganglionic fibers, so again, when you hear fiber, think axon, to the autonomic ganglia outside of the central nervous system. Now, remember, ganglia are cell bodies, so in these cell bodies, the fibers synapse on the ganglionic neurons, and then the postganglionic fibers that are, again, going to take away that message They'll leave that ganglia and innervate cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, glands, and adipocytes. This sounds really complex, but it's just fancy names for passing on that impulse. Now, there are two divisions of the ANS, the sympathetic, often called the fight or flight system because it usually stimulates tissue metabolism, increases alertness, and prepares the body to deal with emergencies. The parasympathetic division is often called the rest repose or rest and digest because it conserves energy, promotes sedentary activities such as digestion. Okay, the sympathetic and parasympathetic affect target organs, and they do this by controlled release of specific neurotransmitters by those postganglionic fibers. Uh, the result could be stimulation or inhibition of an activity. There are some general patterns. Uh, the preganglionic autonomic fibers are 
cholinergic. They release acetylcholine and are always excitatory. So we've talked about this type of synapse before. Uh, the postganglionic and parasympathetic fibers are also cholinergic, but they aff the effects can be excitatory or inhibitory. It depends on the nature of the target cell receptor, what uh, the sensory information tells uh, the CNS, and then outputs to the PNS. The most postganglionic sympathetic fibers, though, they're going to release norepinephrine, designated by this NE here, making them adrenergic, and those are usually excitatory. So remember, this is something that's going to happen in that fight or flight response. All right, there are some relationships between these two divisions. The sympathetic has widespread effects reaching visceral and somatic structures throughout the body. The parasympathetic innervates only visceral structures serviced by the cranial nerves or lying within the abdominal pelvic cavity. Uh, most vital organs are going to be duly innervated, which means they receive instructions from both of these divisions. Um, when we do have dual innervation, uh, the divisions often have opposing effects, and they are uh, outlined in this table here. This is also going to tell you the functions of both divisions. So this, this table is very important for you to jot down um, exactly what's on here, what happens within these structures or systems, the sympathetic effects, and then the parasympathetic effects. And you should be able to see uh, one will activate and one may inhibit, um, and vice versa. So uh, definitely jot down this chart. It's also on page 293 of your book, and um, that is all for Chapter 8. Uh, I'll see you guys next time.